Just right back, Charlie. Oh, 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 I'm back again. Come on, Ian. Come on, Ian. <laughs> Come on, Ian. Showtime. People deluded. I'm back again. Somebody who I've wanted to get on this platform for a while to discuss Arsenal. George, how you doing, man? You good? I'm great, man. I'm great. It's great to be here. I can't wait. Come on, my guy. That's the energy I love to hear. Obviously, we're still flying high with Arsenal. Let's kick off there. In fact, where's my manners? Big up everyone across Twitch and YouTube. Obviously, this is my first time speaking to you about a lot of things. I want to ask you about, first and foremost, how do you feel about life under Mikel Arteta and obviously our ownership? Has there ever been times where you haven't necessarily seen what Arteta is doing? And what, what do you make of us now? Um, I feel I've been one of the very few that have always felt there's been reason to have faith. And I think I saw reasons for why people lost faith. But I think when you start to analyze some of the moves that we made back in the background staff, the setting of philosophy, the culture, some of those non-negotiables that I think people get clowned for quoting, if you sit back and actually start to try to get the broad bird's eye view of it, you start to see that really everybody and every big club, by the way, has been trying to replicate some of those rebuilding steps in the manner in terms of Bayern Munich, Barca right now, United, Chelsea. There's a lot of clubs in rebuilds right now. And I think they're starting to look at the Arsenal structure, how they did it. And I just feel as though I really had faith in how we were doing it the right way. And not necessarily in terms of one philosophy, because I think you can be successful in a multitude of ways. But the way in which they systematically almost prepared the infrastructure to maintain whatever Mikel wanted made me believe, OK, this is sustainable. If it didn't work with Mikel, and I always use this argument, if it didn't work, I felt as though, OK, the structure is in place that I see a vision for how Arsenal want to play. I see how the academy is set up to that vision. I see that there were steps made that weren't wedded to Mikel, despite Mikel being incredible in my own humble opinion. But let's say I was wrong. I think that's what a successful club must do. And for example, I look at Manchester United now, a club that have never gotten it right really over the years, and they're starting to make yeah. moves. Yeah, and, and you know, thank goodness they deserve it. I must add, but <laughs> amen. You know, uh, I just I see the moves: Omar Bereda, Sam Wilcox, right? Like the, the the infrastructure that they're building. You can start to see, okay, you know what? Maybe the manager in Eric Ten Hag is not the one, which I don't believe he is, but the structure is there. So, so, so that's why I had the faith. But look, I, I'm not going to be here and kind of be obtuse to the other side. There was a period, especially during that run where we couldn't buy a win, you know, back in 2021 that I think there was a lot of questions asked, valid questions for sure. Um, and so I understood the frustrations of fans. I personally wasn't there, but I understood. What would you say then? Because I'm, I'm with you. I'm not going to sit here and say I could predict the future and things like that. But Arteta showed me enough to believe in whether it was going left and right. Of course, there was times I sat there and thought, oh, you know what? Is this really going to happen? But I have mm -hmm. to give the club faith. You know, they had, as you said, they had broadly terms that they wanted to stick to, what they wanted to do. And they've they've weathered the storm, really. For me, I was convinced with Arteta just one based on the conviction he spoke with from the moment this man came in. I think every decision so far has gone right, but naturally he'll get decisions wrong. But I think where you look at keeping Xhaka with the whole Aubameyang stuff and many stuff like that, situations where he could have wavered, he stood firm. And I always back someone that stands firm in their beliefs and what they want to do. And as you said, the non-negotiables, you know, there's plenty of sound bites. the non-negotiables, the, you know, the, People laugh on Twitter about winning duels. I know people laugh about the atmosphere at Anfield and the, the speakers he was using in, in the All or Nothing. But there's a lot of innovative things that I like from him. Of course, you know, he, he, he's taking players and making them better. He's making us unpredictable. I love what he's doing, man. I still think there's a bit of weaknesses in, in, in him, as I would expect. Mm -hmm. He's still early in his managerial career. And for me, he's got big bollocks because... 
this was a massive job to take. I understand, you, you know, we went, we tried to go for him before Emre. We didn't take him. He didn't want to go and do it then. And then, I mean, after Wenger, after Emre came in. And that's a massive task for you to take in your first job. And I really like that. I always compare it, and it's not the best of examples. It's like someone not knowing how to swim and jumping in the strongest current in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. That's exactly yeah. what he did. And he's, and he's benefiting from it. Obviously, you're not Mikel Arteta, and I don't expect you to be able to answer it. But a lot of talk is about phases and things of that nature. What phase do you think we're in or where do you think Arsenal are at now? Is it is the task now we're here to win trophies or is there still some steps before we can wholeheartedly say that? I think that the squad is in a place right now where it's ready to win trophies. I think when it's we're not at the stage of being favourites and we're not being st at, the, right. at the stage of necessarily being the predicted winners at the start of the season. I think everybody can now go confidently into the season saying Arsenal will challenge for the league title. That, for example, is a phase that I'm confident doing right now. And I'm confident, by the way, that we will be one of the teams competing for the Champions League. And, I, and not just competing, I think in a semi-final capacity. I think that that's the level of this team. In terms of taking that next step, I do still believe that the attack has needed investment. I think that we've received yep. over 100 million pounds of investment from goalkeepers to the defense. And of course, the big man, Declan Rice, my favorite person. Um, in midfield, so I think Facts. every single attack, like department, has received investment bar the attack. And look, to a certain degree, I think people miss the point that Arteta inherited two hundred million pound assets in Martinelli and Saka. There was a reason for delaying potentially that investment, but it is time. It is time to invest in that area. And I think once we're able to do that, I will sit ten toes deep and say, "Listen, we're ready to be favorites for the title." But until that moment happens. There's just a little bit of extra quality that I would like to see. But you know what? I still believe that this season there's a chance to do something special. If you're going to sit there and ask me how I feel about this season, which I'm sure we'll get into, I'm not going to hide from the fact I feel that we do something special this season. But I think it has a little bit more to do with the ability of us to compete amongst other teams that aren't at their peak. I think if I look at Manchester City, if I'm being really, really fair, I don't feel that they're the same city of the last five, six years. I think that there's an opportunity here. And I think with Liverpool as well, I don't see a team necessarily that are as complete as the Liverpool teams in the past that a lot of people want to quote. So I think like in that sense, there's an opportunity for Arsenal to compete. But at the same time, mate, like I don't know how you feel. I've never seen a three horse race to this degree and to this quality this late. So it's very unpredictable. I don't think that we've seen it before. And so I think fundamentally there's a chance for us this season, but I wouldn't put us as favorites. And so I think that's the phase that we're at. Like you said there, I wouldn't have us as favourites. I think we're like the new kids on the block. We're a breath of fresh air. And like last season, I think we've learned our mistakes from last season, how it kind of ended. This season, I I mean, it's hard not to be optimistic. I'm necessary, I'm quite pessimistic on our winning champs and prems just because I don't think we're kind of what you said. I don't think we're quite head there yet for me to come out with chess and say we're going to win. I always say the one thing I like about Arsenal is... We're very, and I'm not saying this to say we're the biggest and baddest team in the world, but it feels like when we lose, it's because we've not quite been at the races or we switched off. It's not because we've been outplayed or the manager's been outsmarted. And I, I agree with what you said. And I want to take the conversation back to that. You mentioned strikers. Now, I do think when you look at Mikel Arteta and you look at his failed pursuits of Mudrik, obviously hindsight, that looks great. We didn't get Rafina, We didn't get Pedro Neto. We tried to get Vlahovic. I know we've brought in... Gabriel Jesus for 45 million. You can extend that to Kai Havertz, who's multifunctional, but playing up front. Why do you think there's been a reluctance from Mikel Arteta to invest in a striker per se? Because as you said, 105 million Declan Rice. We've signed a lot of centre-backs. He loves a goalie. Yeah, man. I mean, I think he's tried. If you look at kind of failed attempts in a sense, it was more Tammy Abraham, Dusan Vlahovic, Dominic Calvert-Lewin. I think there was a particular type of striker that he he does like. But again, I think the market dictates what you can do, right? I mean, in, in a sense that there was a multitude of priorities because I always use this analogy. We had a hole with multiple holes and it was a matter of you filling what hole you could. And I mean, I think the market yeah. gives you it gives you an opportunity to maybe say, okay, there's still a hole in the bow, but you know what? It's not as big as, as in the front of the boat. And so I think it, it was a matter of, kind of balancing those priorities. I still think in his heart of hearts, and I think you're going to see it this summer, when he's been able to really set stone, if you're going to have a coach that has multiple holes, I always say fix the spine. Fix the spine and make sure that that center of the pitch is complete. Once that's complete, you can build. And you can build sustainable play. 
And so once that's done, I think Mikel feels a little bit more comfortable to say, look, we can maybe take a risk in some signings. You know, I look at a player like, not a striker, but a player like Nico Williams, for example, a really talented prospect that I think has a really favorable release clause. That's something that I think Arsenal can chance now. Before they had to get every single penny right in order to compete in the manner Facts. and make sure the trajectory went up, they couldn't have any wasted money. And I don't think that Nico Williams is wasted money. But a Mudrick, you can see the potential of what young prospects can give you in terms of how ready and how raw they might be. And so that's the balance. That's the key balance they've been played. But to answer the question, not beat around the bush, I think this year is definitely the year that we look towards a marquee forward. I don't know if I'm as strong on it being a striker per se. I still think that left wing and striker really depends on how you see Gabriel Martinelli in the squad. And I think how you see his long-term future best dovetailing. And I think you try to maximize funds in that sense. So I'm not dead set on it being a striker per se, but I definitely think a marquee forward's the play. I must admit, I changed my mind quite a lot. Like, I do want to, I would love a striker and a winger. I think that would be great. I am sure. starting to believe we might go for a multifunctional kind of guy that can fill in the gaps where, where appropriate. And then I'm I'm of the belief, and something that is positive and negative is Mikel Arteta has shown, and not even just him, Edu and everyone connected. If they do not have a hundred percent conviction with someone, then it's better to do rightly or wrongly, it's better to do nothing than to do something where we've seen actually under Mikel Arteta and Edu been before them when we've tried to do the opposite, it hasn't quite worked out. I, I must admit, I am I can't really make out what sort of striker Mikel Arteta is looking for. Obviously, goals would be a help and is the primary job of a striker, but I do think people are quite naive if they think a striker is just gonna stand in the opposition's area and have to do nothing. It's all about the defensive aspects and and all the multifunctional stuff that goes into it under Arteta. Because if being quote-unquote clinical was what made you a striker, then with the greatest of respect for all of Kai Havertz's strength and his form, Gabriel Jesus, Eddie Nketiah, and even Trossard, they would not be leading the line for the club. So what sort of profile do you think it is then? Because we've been linked with, what, Sesco, Ivan Tony, Goya Keres, the list goes on, we'll be here, awesome men, we'll be here all day. And also a bit of a double question, like on top of the profile, which one would it be for you if you had to pick? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think here, I'll describe the traits because I think that's not specific to maybe a left wing or a striker. The traits that this front line needs for me is searing pace. I Fact. really don't feel that this front line is a quick front line. There's a lot of ball to feet players, and I think that that's one of the top priorities. Another one, look, you have to be involved in the press. You have to be somebody that, for me, will either learn to appreciate that part of the game or at least comes with that ability. Fact. But that means repeat sprint ability. You can't have a player that physically is unable to do those things. Maybe they don't have the motivation, but they must have the physical capacity to be able to keep that up for 90 minutes. Facts. So that's so that's one thing. Another thing, they also have to be able to overload wide. I think I look at the best parts of Gabriel Jesus pre-injury, and that was the fluidity he provided in terms of not being wedded to a particular side, left or right. He has to have no angle bias, I like to say. So he has Facts. to be able to fill in in multiple areas. And so that... And lastly, the most important thing, they need to have box presence. I look at every single person in that front line, and I don't see a dominator in the six-yard box. I don't see somebody that when they have space in that box, it's chance, goal, chance, goal. And you can see it in our biggest games, by the way. You look at the miss with Trossard. You look at some of the cutback misses from Saka out to Jesus. You look at Anfield, even how many, times margins, have we, yeah. how many times have we floated a ball across the six yard box and we don't find somebody hungry to be there. We see people arriving at the top of the box, but there's no one in there that wants that goal. And so um, I think that in addition, I might add one more trait, aerial ability in the box that's That'd clinical. That would be lovely because I don't think we do enough half space crossing. I look at Trent, I look at Kevin De Bruyne, and I look at the manner of our attacks. We're brilliant at cutbacks into the box, but we don't necessarily float crosses from a half space position near enough to these they're quite top. rare you can count on one and really and truly like i, I think declan rice mm -hmm. against luton towards the end of the game so you're bang on the money with that so those are the traits now who's the person get off the fence george absolutely look there is one man for me and it's victor osaman is the complete package in in terms of what i feel this team needs he has an outlet to be able to receive over the top of the press he's got brilliant ability to interchange either side He's got this physical aura, this gravity that he pulls defenders alone purely because of his physical traits. And he creates space for other people in that manner. And of course, he's a box dominator, probably the best aerial forward in the world. 
And I think that in terms of the six yard box, he's got almost Cavani esque movement. I don't think he's got the cleanest of ball striking techniques, but I think his movement is top tier. And in terms of dominating that six yard area, there's very few strikers in world football that do it to the degree that he's able to do it. And I can name you almost five specific types of plays. I can guarantee you Osaman goals. Half space crossing from Fabio Vieira or sack of back post, boom. Cash money goal. Set pieces, by the way. Cash money goal. If you want to really talk about into the channels, how about those floated balls from Ben White or the cutbacks at the top of the box? Goals. Like I I think that there is so many ways that he complements this team. And lastly, look at the pressing. This guy is repeated sprint ability. For a superstar, he's very humble in the work he does out of possession. Yeah. Does a lot of dirty work. A ton of dirty work. So I think I think he's brilliant. And it's not exactly groundbreaking analysis to pick the 100 million pound striker that everybody wants in the market. But I think he offers you quite a bit of those traits that I was talking about earlier. In a different way, another player that we've been linked with, Alexander Isaac, that I see already in the comments that people are shouting about, I think he offers quite a bit different to Victor Osama, but would still be successful with Arsenal. But I don't think he's the same type of striker. And the one thing that I miss with Alexander Isaac is that kind of box dominance in the six yard area. I think he's, he's a bit more he's gracious a, than Osman. Much more. But and also he also likes to drop deep. He's more of that, you know, kind of striker that would like to come to the ball and use it to dribble and then arrive into the box. He's not necessarily somebody that would come deep, link up with one or two touches and explode into the box. He he is somebody that likes to come too. now, granted. I think he's got some of the best shot placement in the box. If I look at Alexander Isaac, I think if you look at the number of his goals and you look at his career goals, he has a brilliant shot placement in terms of always placing it away from the goalkeeper. So I don't think he's somebody that would lack goals or not get goals. And I think his goals to minute ratio is something like the best in the Premier League, despite his injury woes this season. So he, he's a brilliantly complete striker. I just think that he would operate in a very different way to Victor Osimhen. And I think we have some of his profile, but to a lesser quality. I look at a Jesus and I look at a Trossard. There is a comparable profile there, but Isaac is just that top tier level of that. So in a sense, you'd have to replace those profiles with something else with, say, a Nico Williams to really make that attack feel complimentary. Um, so I, I think there's different ways you can go. I prefer the Victor Osman because I think with one purchase, boom, your front line's fixed and complete. Um, but then again, I think there's a lot of people that would like a versatile attacker in addition to maybe a big marquee, which is something I'm a fan of as well. And I've made no qualms about who that player is throughout the stream. And it's one man, Nico Williams. Who would you, what would, um, as you said, a lot of things. I've got so many things I want to ask you. A lot of people, I agree with what you said about Osman, but a lot of people have some concerns about him. Is there any concerns? Because I feel, even me, as much as I like Osman, I like Jokerez. I don't feel there's a striker that I'm 100% convinced by. There's 98s, there's 80s, there's 70s. But yeah, is there any other weak? Is there weaknesses in potentially Osman's game? Because no player is perfect. No player is perfect. I think he's somebody that lacks the pace of his final ball. So when he does come deep, I, I think ironically, he gets a lot of the criticisms that Gabriel used to have because he's got a very weird gait. So people assume he has a poor touch, but he doesn't. He has a great touch. But the turn and face and then the play in... That is something that Osman doesn't do very well. I don't think he has great pace on his passing in the final third. And I think when he does drop deep, he tends to overhit passes. Um, now, I think that's something you can work on. It's not something drastic, but it is a huge weakness in his game. And it's why the likes of the Ivan Tonys, the Isaacs, by the way, those type of strikers that their strength is a final ball, people like to compare the two. Um, also, I do feel at times he is going to be wasteful. Now, no striker isn't. But I don't think he has necessarily got the same ball striking capacity as, say, a Dusan Vlahovic, a Sesko, some of these other, a Marcus Rashford, like that top tier ball striking, he doesn't have. He does rely much more on his movement. He does rely much more on maybe a variety of finishes, but not necessarily that um, gunman type shots from outside the box. He's no Evan Ferguson that will slap it 18 yards away. Um, I think he's a different type type of striker he can work on those things but yeah those are i think his two major weaknesses that i would i would highlight with him you mentioned that you mentioned the player's name and it's quite interesting because whenever i talk about him on my channel i get a lot of heat and say oh he rejected us we can't go back in for him blah 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 blah. what mm. do you make of vlahovic and if arteta had even a little thought in his head to spin the block would you do it 
I'd look at it and I, you know, I, I, my comparison on Twitter was he's 2014 Harry Kane, not quite the, the build-up version, but you remember when he I first came the on the scene? I see the angle. I see the angle. Why, why you would say that? I see why you, yeah, I see why you would say that. Because he, he, because he, he, he has the vision for the passes, but he's not completing it yet. He still is somebody that cut, likes to drop deep, dink, one-two touch, and then burst into the channels. But um, I, I love Vlahovic. I, I thought when we were linked, I thought it was a very good deal. I don't think he was worth the marquee money of 75 million plus at the time. Uh, so the value for me, I struggled with. But in terms of a striking package, he is a little bit more in that. Again, the 2014 Harry Kane. I think he'll grow up to be that type of striker. So. Uh, he, he did have a little bit of an ability to almost have a little bit of bias to the right-hand side, though. I did notice this when I started scouting him. Like, he dropped deep, and then he would open and face play to the left, which is natural as a lefty, right? Like, he would open towards the left, and he would see that pass. But very rare would he see the reverse pass on the opposite side. So he had a little bit of that, which I think isn't a bad thing if you want Saka closer to goal. Like, he's going to interact on that side a little bring bit him in, yeah. So there, there's that benefit. But also, he is a striker that's between the posts. Like, I, he is not somebody that would overload out wide. And so you would have to change a little bit how you play. And that's not a problem. But it does for me. I always go to the line flexibility. And I love a striker that can dominate the channels, dominate the wings. Because as a coach, I've sat there thinking, how do I stop you? Well, if I can stop and plug the center, I stop your service. In the Not same Holland. way that you stop to Holland, right? So... I don't think that same thing of Isaac or Osman, by the way. Both are comfortable on the wing and both will do you on the wing if you give them time and space. So that that's the one advantage I would have over somebody like a Vlahovic or, again, even a Ferguson. Like These are players that are between the posts in terms of their effectiveness. And I just don't see them have the physical capacity to learn to do it on the wings. And that's not a problem, but you just got to know the type of striker that you're playing with. I mean, I've got to push an agenda. I'm a big fan of Benjamin Sesko. So because you mentioned him, what's your thoughts on him? Man? I think he's a big, big player. He's very raw, very rough diamond. But yeah. I think all the other, I think all the elements are there. He's almost not quite a blank canvas because he's got a relative a foundation of experience. But I think he's got a relative blank canvas that Arteta would work with, in my humble opinion. I think I, people would look at him and think, you're not going to immediately get what Osman would get us and things like that in terms of goals. But he could grow into something special. But what's your thoughts on Sesko, man? I love Sesco. I've talked about him before he was popular. And Amen. Uh, Amen. You know, Amen. <laughs> I think uh, I've used the words if you could grow a striker in a lab, like in the perfect terms. It's, it's like a beta Yeah. And I, I'll even go bolder. I think he reminds me a lot of Benzema, like a young Benzema, but with physical edge, with that physical edge that he just didn't have. He's what, 6'3? Sprint ability, absolute frightening pace and you know he's got that uh that want to be involved in play he has everything that people love about alexander isaac and everything that people love about the channel running and a victor osaman the only you. problem is he is raw he he's is so raw. raw and he's incredible and people hear these words and they say oh so he's better than x no 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 hold on this is the profile people hear what they want to hear man and so in a sense, the one question I do have is, does this Arsenal team have time to wait? And Yes and no. And, it's, and that's the problem. So I've always felt like, okay, of course they're going to save money by buying the man early. But does Arsenal have a platform to develop him with these minutes while fighting for leagues? That's a question that I'm struggling with. And this is why I always tell people, guys, we're at a point where this team doesn't need much. Just buy him when he's ready. Sure, it'll be more expensive. But if you believe he is the man, fix your team in other areas and then let him develop in terms of not trying to put him in a team that's ready to challenge, but he's not ready to challenge. That's the only struggle that I have with Sesco. But in terms of profile wise, and if I'm analyzing weaknesses, mate, I really don't have many with Sesco. It's just, it's his decision making, his timing on pressing. Don't mind the little fine tunings. Yeah. But and you know what? Those, those fine tunings. They they make it seem worse than what he is, in my opinion, because it's so raw. Like you look, I think Mudrick is a really good example in terms of going to a team not ready and a terrible when you're, env environment for him as well. It's it's horrible. And actually, when you look at him, he was what 22, 23. Yeah. While the greatest of respect to the Ukrainian league, it's a massive jump for someone, and he ain't huge. got the strongest body of work in terms of games as well. 
huge, but I use him as an example of somebody that's a physical stud people get excited about. He's got prime sample in a Bernabeu about big moments. And then you sit there and you're like, well, what happened at Chelsea? Well, he's still the same player. He's not any different. But in terms of that development curve, He's A, not gone to a team that plays to his strength. It's B, he's not gone to an environment that allows him to grow. Yes. And this is why you're seeing this. So I worry about that in a different way. I think at Arsenal, you have a structure that allows anybody to grow. And I think that you've got a coach that allows you to grow no matter yep. what. And so yep. in that sense, you're definitely going to get it. But I think striker is a big position, mate. And, it is. you know, you can't hide... And I think that there's a lot of fans that are sitting there saying, I want my Declan Rice in, in the attack. And um, I could have quoted you a ton of brilliant midfield prospects, by the way, that weren't Declan Rice last year. But I guarantee you, if I'm sat here right now asking you, would you like Capron Thurum, who's a great prospect, or Declan Rice? Obviously, there's, Declan Rice. Obviously, yeah, Declan there's Rice. There's a difference. Is there something different when you sign those block? But obviously, they have to work because everybody signs sure. every signs big, big money players. But it worked. And obviously, I praise Arteta. I praise Arteta for how Declan Rice has fitted in. But we all knew Declan Rice would work. But in terms of that new look, Declan Rice and him in the final third, that's all on Arteta. But and I do once once you've introduced me to that lifestyle, definitely since when Arteta walked in and we had some players that weren't of that level, I don't really want to go back to it. And it's it, it takes me back to what you said, which is very interesting in relation to Sesco and do we have time? I feel we do have time to wait because nobody in that team, even Declan Rice, bar part a Jorginho, they're not going to get massively better. Nobody's mm -hmm. the finished article, neither is the manager. And you could argue with a team that, you know, is almost, it's nothing like City, but was like City when, before they signed Haaland, where they had a false nine and they were scoring whole, a whole leap of goals. We've shown that we can share the burden and shed the burden without necessarily having a prolific man. And with Sesco being, if he did come in and was like a seasonal, rotational kind of striker, I think he, he could grow with us, again, with, with all the other players. But where I think no is, because of what you're saying is, everything Carter is doing and everything me and you could waffle about for hours about with Arteta and shout out Alex in the chat good as well. Mm. It's all geared to making us title contenders or Champions Leagues and things like that. So time is a bit of an illusion and fans ain't going to yeah. listen to that when we're not doing what we're doing because they've the gone to sack already. And the only thing I'll tweak with that, which is a brilliant point, title favourites, not just challengers. That's there you the, go. Yeah, yeah. There you the go. Yeah, step. yeah, yeah. There you and, go. And, and you can't, like, I think you can challenge with a Sesco. Can you be title favourites? Well, get over the line. Oof. That's that's difficult because now you're saying, OK, are you are you competing with Holland? What do you got? And, and you know what? And if you ain't got I, 20 goals, it's, forget about it. Really, it's, it's a little peak. It's a little peak in that sense. But I mean, I think also the one thing that I did want to talk about, too, is look at the type of strikers that the best teams in the Premier Leagues have gone to have gone for. Nunez, Holland. Now, different qualities, but look at the profile of striker there. That's physical, physical channel runners. There's a reason. There's a reason for it. You and don't want them in, you don't want to play against them in, in open space, which is why I'm happy Arsenal kind of shut up shopping that regards against Haaland. And a hundred percent. But you know, I think it actually speaks to the transition in the league with everybody going to more, more positional play, even the lower teams like your Brightons, you've got Fulham's, you've got Bournemouth's, you've got everybody attempting to play football. You don't have the Burnley's and the Stokes anymore. This is not a common place in the league. I think that they won't last long doing that. You won't. And it's just modern football. But again, mate, like, you know what it is? I think because of that, it means that the types of low blocks that you're going to be facing mean there's only a couple ways that you can move people. You can move people physically. And I think everybody that's played football knows what we're talking about. You've got to physical dominate your zone. You can go over the top of people. You can go around them or you can go through them. That's really, there's no other way. Football's not or it's, or, it's, or it's the runs you make off the ball, the space you occupy and people that thrive in that. It's like what Pep said, to echo what you just said, which is brilliant. It's like when Pep said, we pass the ball to move the opposition, not necessarily yes. move ourselves. So you're bang on the money with that. And that goes back to what you said about someone like Osman that maybe in sometimes you could just buy a yard of space because of your technical level and get a goal. I personally think when Arsenal fans talk about strikers, generally, not saying you or me, I don't think there's any in between. I think there's some fans that are up there like, oh, we're yeah. sharing the goals. We don't need one. And there's some that are saying we need we need one. No one's quite good enough. I think we need a striker. I think a lot of our issues when we haven't scored are either, like against City, half chances. We didn't really create much. Our players are kind of volume kind of attackers in that regards. They're not really clinical. And when I look back to the end of last year, 
you know, it's the same players that are scoring goals. It was psychological. That's why I think whether it's a Sesko, whether it's uh, an Osman, we need another striker because I'm not suggesting to sign Sesko because he's getting 10 goals. But in those periods where we've needed a, ga- a goal, sorry, in those games and we had them, them 10 goals can be the difference between, as you said, title challenges or title contenders. So you're kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. We yeah. can't not speak about strikers without speaking about two players, man. I want to talk about Kai Havertz. I want to ask you this because, again, we know that we need multifunctional players. There's a lot of games and there's rotation and all of that stuff. But if we're naming our strongest 11 and we assume that we sign an Osman or whatever, is Kai Havertz in that team? Big question. Um, <laughs> I think that um, I, I think that when I look at Mikel's structure of the team, I've always felt that Kai Havertz would come into the team and he wouldn't play his best position. And the best position for me in this team is center forward. In the future team of Arsenal, I don't think that he's able to do that. And I think that, especially when you buy somebody like a Victor Osman, can they play together? I actually think that they would play brilliantly together. I think you've got a physical back. He's a good team player. He's brilliant. And you know what I think? When when Osman drops deep for a knockdown, Kai Havertz is on the run. On and his then back, yeah. Mar- Martin Odegaard receives that. And guess what? Osman peels the opposite direction. Now you've got two strong runners that are going. I think it would and be brilliant. And you've got eight midfield runners as well. It, I think it would be work. sexy football, man. Oh, it would be brilliant. But I think the, the formation that you're doing is that typical Johan Cruyff 3-4-3 diamond. And you're looking at Kai Havertz as the second striker at the tip of that diamond. Um, and I, I think that's how you're going to be building the team in the future. And you look at kind of your Martin Odegaard and I think you need a defensive shuttler to complement the Declan Rice in that four. So if you've got Kai Havertz, you've got Odegaard in a four midfield, whether that's a box or a diamond, it doesn't matter. But you need another defensive presence in addition to Declan Rice there just for complementary balance. And I really think that's Timber. I've made the point since he was signed. Oh, man, I knew to get you on my platform, man. Timber, for me, he's going to be amazing, player. man. He, he's Seriously. one of the best in his position in the Prem already. I, and, I, and I know he's only played 50 minutes, but I'm willing to stick out my chest and say that, and people will see in the future. But no, now I, he's injured. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think he's our homemade Caicedo, I said, in the summer. And Explain that, to because I saw your tweet and I get it. But to those who have just heard that comment, what do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think he's somebody that offers versatility in terms of being able to play in both fullback areas that steps into midfield. But really, when you analyze what is Timber brilliant at, it's that sharp half turn on the agility. And then when he gets Fact. it, he, he has brilliant vertical agility in the center of the pitch. He can reach second balls like no other. So he's got that intensity with a really snappy defensive tackle. We've all seen it. But I don't very think what tigerish. people... Very tigerish. And I think what people don't see, though, by the way, is that dribbling ability and that underlap ability where I feel that he sees brilliant passes. And I think he's got a brilliant disguised pass on him which just means, you know, essentially he's not able to telegraph his passes, which is really important for people in those tight areas. And I think that if you start to analyze some of his uh, previous work, not just at Ajax, but I think also at Feyenoord, he was uh, attacking midfielder as well. Like he's got that brain for attacking areas. And sure enough, Mikel came, came out with a quote, you know, today talking about how important he would be in those attacking areas. And it's because he offers you that brilliant versatility of carrying and passing with the Fast. second ball prowess it's not one or the other and i just think it's a brilliant profile it's both and that's why you're you're going to be able to see him in higher areas and i make him wow it'd be it's it's incredible because i think they offer very complementary stuff ben is more of an overlapper i don't see him underlap in the same sense timber will and so that kind of complementary pair i think keeps people guessing and, you know, when I talk about Caicedo, I've always felt that Caicedo was never the lone six that people believed him to be. I Hasn't thought he was more... Really to do it like that, man. No, and, and, I just, and I just think when you see it for the national team, you see similarities in Timber in terms of the build, the way they meet people in defensive transition, the way that they both see passes. I think that they're not somebody that, you know, is going to have a final ball that will excite you, but they have that pass before Over the pass. 90 minutes. Yeah, and, and you know what? It, it, I, I think that's the transition we'll see with Yuri and Timber down the line. I mean, again, listen, this is why I needed you on my channel. It's so refreshing <laughs> to have a football chat with a real footballing brain. Like you said, with Timber, it's going to be amazing. I do feel with Timber, I think fans have to kind of 
allow him a bit, kind of calm down, let him get his fitness back, let him get yeah. back to stuff. Don't I, I see Alex tweet it all the time when he inevitably has that rusty game or that rusty moment? Don't backtrack on the guy, just let the guy get back up to speed. We've been speaking about strikers, and me personally, I think fans are quite disrespectful to Gabriel Jesus. We know goals are a problem of his, he's had a platform to be the out and out number nine, and it hasn't quite worked out in terms of goal scoring. But at a time, he transformed our, our kind of fortunes, really, brought a winning mentality, everything Mikel Arteta demands in a striker, he brings that. Yes, he's been a bit rusty and the injuries are concerning, but when I see rhetoric like sell Gabriel Jesus, I'm sorry, but I think that's nonsense. That man has to be part of the squad. I'm not saying he needs to play on a regular basis, but you can't want to be a team that wins trophies and at the first port of call where we're actually looking like a team that can do that in the last two years, get rid of Gabriel Jesus. I'm, I, I, everyone's allowed their opinions. I just think it's nonsense, but what, 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 where are you at with Gabriel Jesus? Gabriel Jesus is a tough one because I think in terms of there being a versatile forward uh, with his quality, there's very, actually, there's not just very few, there isn't somebody that has that ability, left, right, center, to perform at an elite level. People forget Gabriel Jesus' last year performance with Manchester City where he was primarily at the right wing. Some might argue that's the second best position. And, you know, in terms of coverage... I think it's a wide position thing for him, just as you said that. I think, naturally, you're going to have to start playing out wide for Arsenal and rotate in that times. I think so. Like, our, this Arsenal team are evolving in terms of the centre of the pitch being a little bit bigger. And if you're going to go with the Alexander Isaac, if you're going to go with the Osaman, these are bigger players that are central, right? So I, I think he's going to have to evolve more in wide areas. The one question is, does he accept it? I think a lot of people have talked about that. I mean, a big reason he left City was to be the main man, number nine at a big club. Right? Like that's that's something that he left for. And I, I just think he's a brilliant player in terms of the qualities that you get. I do worry about him post-injury, whether or not he has the same physical capacity to maintain that burst in the Maisie runs. I think he's just as agile. I think he's still able to turn in the same way. But I don't see him able to create that same physical separation that he made. If you remember back to last year, as well, man. it's gone. And so, I mean, I think I want to see more. I don't want to write that off. But I just I've seen little little periods of play where I feel like, oh, you should get there. Like I know the Jesus yeah. physically of last year gets there. Now it's not a technical thing, and so that's where I'm like, I really need to make sure that that continues. In terms of selling, look, mate, like I think that comes into a question of whether or not we're able to do two major forward signings this summer. And then where do you see that front line? For example, I would probably sell Trissard first over Jesus in that case. Like if we got a versatile forward, I'd sell Reese Nelson. There's some other tr thin, like tr uh, fat trimming that you can do in the squad before trimming Max. one of your best players of last season. Now, fans got that, a, small, a short memory, man. If I'm honest. They, you know, but you know what? They have a short memory with injuries. I see this all the time. And it's a case of you kind of... Both. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's fine. Technical difficulties, folks. All right. Um, what was I going to ask you, man? City. Talk to me about Man City, man, because I personally am exhausted. You know, people said, oh, Arsenal have to win to show their title contender. Da, 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 da. We go there, we shut up shop. Oh, you didn't entertain us. Last time I checked, entertainment didn't win trophies. I saw Leeds United get relegated. Go I'm on, just going to change rooms. Go on, 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 go on. Just remember the question. <laughs> yes. Have you, what do you want me to? Yeah, yeah, go on, go on. He's changing rooms, people. He's changing rooms. He saw a couple of you lot's comments. Totally disagree with your guests on Victor Rossum and overrated Steve. But that's the beautiful thing about football. Everybody, no, everyone's got an opinion. Nobody's right, nobody's wrong. Hindsight's a lovely thing. Where Victor Rossum con concerns me, I, I do think he's overrated in the sense of. When a player is linked with a football club like Zubamendi, your carers, Victor Rossman, they're seen as the messiah. They can turn, you know, water to wine and things like that. I think, you know, people move like they haven't got any frailties in their game. But if we could get Victor Rossman done, I'm I'm all for it, if I'm completely honest with you, man. I'm, for, I'm all for it. Havertz is a second striker. I think Havertz is the perfect squad player for Arsenal. I think he will get regular football. Arteta's paid for him and he trusts him, bro. I think there's the occasional big games like you've seen where Havertz is, is utilised in that. Kind of going back to what me and George said, it's almost like 
I think in world football, but under Mikel Arteta, it's a double-edged sword being a striker in many degrees. Like you could get 20 goals, but if you're not score, if you're not assisting and dropping deep, people get onto you. You could do all of that, but if you're not scoring, there's issues. And Havertz can affect the game without necessarily scoring. Havertz is a good player across 90 minutes. You know, he'll ruffle feathers, he'll he'll be an aerial target of sorts. He's a big game player. I mean, I said in the summer when it came to Havertz, I didn't understand how some fans were kind of writing him off. I didn't expect him to be a messiah and things like that. If you told me he'd be starting against City, I'd say you're bugging out. But I thought give him a chance. But that being said, in the summer, I was happy with the Timber signing. I was happy with the Rice signing. I was more looking at the Havertz signing and thinking, you know what? I trust Mikel Arteta. I think Havertz is a good player, but I can't see how we. What, I can't see what we're seeing now. So I'll give Mikel Arteta the trust. Unfortunately, the sixty-five million pound man's worked out. He definitely looks better up front than in 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 the left eight, which rises into question what me and George were talking about. You know, if when if we signed the midfielders and the wingers and the attackers and we had the eleven or. 16 squad that we want where does Havertz on paper fit in we know across a season there's game time there's injuries and there's the rest of it so yeah it's interesting yeah Havertz best position is probably where Odegaard plays do you know what there is reality for Odegaard to play as an eight and Havertz to be in that 10 but the 10 role for Havertz isn't going to be what Odegaard's doing it would be more the pressing more of an outlet and things of that help Ramsdale for Rizat plus cash I hear that I hear that I hear that. We're just waiting on George. We want to see Verts. Who wouldn't want Florian Verts? But I just think he's probably going to stay at Leverkusen for one more year and then he's going to have the top Spanish teams on him. Jesus still has a place in the squad. He can take the Eddie role and actually pull it off. I think people are disrespectful to Jesus. I think Jesus, for himself, is put up or shut up. If you want to play, whether that's Havertz's position, Saka's position or uh, Martinelli's, you've got to go and take it back really and truly. I think we should do exactly what Manchester City did with Gabriel Jesus in that you're a strong player, you're a squad player, you're an exciting player, but we're not living or dying by definitely you scoring goals. You can give something to the squad. There's a lot of players that need to leave, in my opinion, way before Gabriel Jesus. I'm a big fan of Trossard. I'm not trying to slander him, but Trossard needs to leave before Jesus. Of course, if Gabriel wants to leave, then fair enough. I think the issue with Gabriel Jesus for me is, even though you can hear I'm, I'm kind of fighting his cases, would be injuries. It's the injuries. Because I think, you know, when I describe Gabriel Jesus, one thing I liked about him signing for Arsenal was durability. You know, he puts his body on the line every game and he's fit nine times out of ten. And it just feels after that World Cup injury, which has nothing to do with Arsenal, hasn't been able to show sustained fitness. And I do think he's hurt his confidence, man. You've seen him, Partey, uh, Tommy Asu. At times, they've looked rusty. On the topic of Partey, he finally looked half decent against City because I think people really underestimate getting back to that level. Ah, he's back now. He's back. Uh, where, 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 yeah, Manchester City, man, because I personally think you you can never win. If we went out yeah. there and we was entertaining like Leeds United when they got relegated last year or like what you see with our rivals down the lane, you're not going to pick up points. There needs to be an element of, of boringness. I think we've kind of blended Arsenal from last season in an attacking sense and we're a lot more cerebral this year. But what did you make of the game? Because I personally think you've got to live to fight another day. If you can't win, don't lose. And I like the fact that the players and Arteta said, we wish we could have got more. And they alluded to... That weren't really how we wanted to play. We was on the counter-attack a bit more than we wanted to. But what's your thoughts, man? I think when you go into a team that hasn't won at the Eddie had since 2015, it is. Mm. And I think that we haven't escaped conceding in the first half since 2016. And I think when you look at Manchester Crazy. City, who um, have scored us, I think it's they've almost gone, how, how long was it? Almost a year and a half. Without, something crazy, something crazy like that. And they don't concede much there as well. No, so I mean, I think like you're going into a situation where people forget these are the treble winners. They're not just a good team. Like, like they're they're probably it's crazy, isn't it? But it speaks of what Arteta is developing here, man. Well, that people are unhappy with a draw at the Etihad, as you said. But you know what? Also, made like I, I kind of look at that pattern of play, and I sit there and I got happy with it. If I know that we've got this low block in our system, I'm sitting and thinking, Same. okay, Bayern away. I'm like, wow, that's exciting. I go to the Bernabeu with defending a lead, and I'm saying, wow, we can do that away. Facts. And we have that in our locker. That's not a bad thing. Now, look, if you're starting to play that type of football, and that's your philosophy, that's your identity, mate, look at Arsenal this season. Who is the best defense in the league? Who has the best second ball in the league? Who is the, the best? least touches in our box. Yeah, I was just going to say. So I'm like, you see all these defensive metrics and you're upset about employing a defensive game plan, like the bedrock about what's made us successful this season. It doesn't make sense to me. And I just think at at the end of the day, you sat there escaping four points 
um, against Pep. Four, pay, four points against Klopp, by the way. Two so clean sheets them. against Pep as well. <laughs> Ridiculous. And, and I'm sorry, where the hell is the pressure for Manchester City? Arsenal were top of the league attempting. Arsenal beat Manchester City twice this season. It wasn't City that had, that had you know... Um, you heard Rodri and Kevin De Bruyne are back to make the difference in form Phil Foden. They, they had everybody. That supposedly meant that they were going to win. And, and I'm sorry, Arsenal are still on top of Manchester City or are they below them? Like, I'm really struggling why the onus wasn't on City to break down that low block and score. people don't like us. Well, I mean, and, and what, how many shots... On target, have Manchester City had against Arsenal this season? Exactly. In the league? Imagine, imagine yeah. if, if, sorry to cut you, but imagine if, the, as you were saying, imagine if the script was flipped and the last three games or so, um, what we've done against City, that happened with Arteta. A bit like under Arsene Wenger, they would say, oh, he hasn't been able to find a plan to undo him and this and that and the third. Even going back to what we're saying about Gabriel Jesus, a lot of people, which I disagree with, were quite critical of his performance at the Etihad. But we saw Gabriel Jesus because we're commenting on it. Where was Haaland? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> well, I mean, and, and, and that's the problem that I've got. Because it's just, look, there's always going to be another hoop to jump through. There's always going to be something that you're going to sit there and say, nice. you know, Arsenal aren't doing this until they win. I, I, I've come very comfortable with it until they lift that trophy. And by that point, boy, you better be quiet because the smack <laughs> that you're going to get is going to be serious. Because it's just the, the stuff that we've had to sit through as a fan base. And you know what, mate? At the end of the day, people are scared. I love it. Because... yeah. It is fear, man. It's fear. It's, fear. It's, it's envy. It's envy because for years mm -hmm. we've been a joke. Like, you know, yeah. I still think there's some mental things we need to get over, but we're coming mm -hmm. out of some tough, and I'm not saying Arsenal the biggest and best in the world, but we're coming out of some tough environments and leaving with something. When there's, it's all fun and games to go and blitz teams, which we've been doing. But when there's time to show resilience, my team have shown that even in times we've lost games. And I think people are really uncomfortable that, we're actually a very good football club again with a very good manager, but I don't know, man. It's it's crazy, you know. I'm sure you see it, Jamie Carragher and Gary Neville. They're kind of changing their tune, but they're forever moving the goalposts, man. It's jarring. It proper annoys me, but forget yeah. them. Yeah, and you know what? Like at the end of the day, you got to focus on your own lawn. And I really, I really, I go. really, I really believe those words. And let, let's continue doing what we're doing. The praise will come. It can come late. One thing I won't do is stand for lies on the narrative of the team. And that's when I start getting a little bit of chest. And that's exactly. when I start talking about it. So it's not that I care what people think or what Jamie Carragher has to say, but I won't let you say lies about the team. And I'll correct you when those things are not true. I don't, I don't need you to believe them, but if you're going to sit there, I think one of the biggest things, I mean, I made this point on another podcast was from an Arsenal perspective, what have, what has been like the biggest narrative in the Wenger years about was what tough. was said about us? It, that was we were tough, stopped. that were pushovers, that we can't react in difficult moments. Right. And you, and you, et can't, cetera, compete, et cetera. you can't compete against the big boys. They're flat track bullies against the bottom of the league. Exactly. You can't compete. Now look at the head to head record of the top six. Who's on top? Arsenal. Who are He's not. on the bottom, actually. Well, not at the bottom, but out of Arsenal and City. Like, if you was to just show people a blank record and say, put the team to what you think, people would think Arsenal's one would be a bit negative. I don't know. I don't make the rules. As you said, you can't argue with data really and truly. And and you just can't you can't argue with facts. They don't care about your feelings at the end of the day. Arsenal exactly. have the best record of the top six teams. And then ultimately, they're also the best defensive team in the league. So when you start to compare, those are the biggest narratives that have plagued Arsenal since later of anger years and i think the media is having a, a, like a problem with that they're the best set piece team in the league that's not arsenal they used to crumble under set piece. We've got a rookie manager to take over basically after Wenger. i know emery was in between like it, this shouldn't work in theory yeah. it shouldn't and and it is special there is a certain level there is total envy because every single pundit has sat there saying that arteta would fail i don't think there was a single pundit that even even in support of what Arsenal were doing, and they're like, even Ian Wright, like I look at some of our most positive Arsenal commentators. Can you really name somebody that with chest 10 toes deep said, Arteta will be a success and take us back to winning trophies? I don't think any, I, I, I think, I, to be fair, I think you're right. I do think Ian Wright said that, but then it goes back, and, and, and you're right, because the media are spreading lies, they've got agendas, but for them fans that weren't a, a media driven, I can't blame them, like them, like them ones that were there, because unless you're at the club, 
you can see things, but you can't necessarily see things. And that's where I give my club credit because it's very easy to be supportive of a project when things are going right. Right When you're, you know, getting battered by Brentford, when you're not bringing in players, when you're bringing in stopgap signings like Pablo, Marie and Cedric, and you're talking about processes, it's very easy to, to, to hit us over the head. So I think you're bang on the money there, man. Yeah, and, and look, I mean, at the end of the day, as long as Arsenal are doing the things that are needed to contribute to success, all of our fans will be happy. But I just think that the media narrative around Arsenal has been poor for a while. And, you know, it's it's difficult to get good Arsenal commentary out there, man. I think people got used to, be, to us being the whipping boys. They enjoyed it. It was fun. And now it's like the little brother grew up to be 18 and he's giving you a little smack back again. Yeah, it's not going to gym. <laughs> people don't like it, you know, <laughs> like... So, and you know, the older brother got a little old, he got 30, you know, his back hurts a bit now. So it's, it's a little bit more difficult. So, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's part of the problem. <laughs> Facts, man. I want to speak, I've got two questions left for you. Yeah? Gabriel yeah, yeah. and Saliba, talk to me about that duo, man. And who do you think has been better? Because I, I try to stay away from this. I think they've both been great. I think they complement each other. It's like ice and fire. But yeah. if I'm honest... I think Gabriel needs a better PR team because I do think Gabriel has just been a tiny bit better than Saliba. But it's not; it's just an in-house conversation for us Arsenal fans. Yeah, you're not you're not drawing up plans to do player wars or anything. But I mean, I there don't think go. there's anything wrong to say that Gabriel's been the more consistent centre back, and I believe that. I think Saliba's had more periods where he's been able to show a better peak performance. Let's yeah. call it. Like I sit there and I say, okay, you've definitely got something about you that sets you apart from a talent perspective. But if you're being fair about consistency and consistency of performances i'd say since november of last year gabriel's been our most consistent center back you know and you know getting rejected for brazil the, you know the the irony of that narrative but like since that point i think he's he's taken another step and the one thing that i'll say is these guys are brilliant mate they're the best center back pairing in the, in the world not in the league 100 well, like, percent. you know and, and that's and that's not even debatable and i think that they just they really are they, the best compliments of each other. And you know what I love right now is I, I, is I find that both of them are taking things from each other in the sense that Gabriel, look at, look at the afters that he has with Holland. I think Gabriel of last year carries that into a fight and it turns into something. Yeah. The emotional control is not there. Now this year he keeps a lid on it. He's relishing kind of, the big brother role in my opinion, kind of going back to the point you made. For sure. And I think he loves that. But there's a level of emotional maturity with Gabriel that I think even when people saw him at the beginning, they felt like he could be a little rash. There were just moments. And I think he learns that composure. from Saliba. And then vice versa. I think Saliba, who's always had the composure, maybe hasn't always been up for the fight in the same way. I think there's times when he's misjudged challenges and especially aerial challenges. I think crosses into the box have been something that was a weakness of his game. Sometimes that not is, aware of the runner. Yeah. Right. And, and that's now becoming, you know, a strength of his. And I just think he's getting that from Gabrielle, that like push to be aggressive in the right moments. And so I just think that together, they, th there's really no limit. Like I, I, I'll go bold. I'll go even bigger. I don't know if we're going to see a better center back partnership in the world for the next five, six, seven, eight years. Like I don't see two people sitting there and kind of reaching the same heights as these two. There's going to be an argument when we start to talk about them in this club's history as some of the best partnerships. And, you know, that can't come until we get the trophies and until we're able to really solidify that opinion. But I, I don't hide from it. I'm going to say it now, say it with chest. Like, I see the level. I see what I'm seeing. Look at the conversations we're having, for Arsenal fans, and people still don't believe in Mikel Arteta. I'm not saying he shouldn't Crazy. be criticised. I'm not saying that, you know, for me anyways, I rate Mikel Arteta highly. So if he does something I don't agree with, I'm going to say, oh, what happened there? I like you a lot. It's coming from a place of love. Yeah. But look at the conversations us two are having, you two are listening. From the moment Arteta walked in, there's no way you cannot say, I'm not saying to blindly trust anything. But you must trust the process. But I cut you off, man. I just felt like it needed to be said there, man. It has to be. And you know what? Like at the same token, like I'm, I'm really happy talking about Mikel's cons because I think they're there. And I don't even want to just speak about them because like, for example, I think his trust in the squad has to improve. I think his experience about when he's using particular squad players has to improve. Like I look in terms of last year, the way that he's used Eddie and Kedia, the way that, you know, he used his squad hasn't been the best. I really think that Maybe not Eddie as a player specifically, but you have to give trust to your squad players. You have to set them up in the right way. And I don't think he's always done that. I think his starting, his plan A is something brilliant. It's always new, it's innovative, and it dominates the league. 
pretty much most of the time. But then the plan B in terms of making sure, for example, when Rob Holding got out injured, I was a big well, fan yelling. Either. I was yelling for Kivior to be the replacement, not Rob Holding. I know what Rob Holding is. But there was a level of seniority that he kind of attributes and he gives to, even when Laka was here. There was a time when Laka shouldn't have been starting and shouldn't have been playing. And I don't think he... I think he leans into experience and to seniority, and you understand that to a degree, but he leans into it a bit too much, so he needs to manage his squad a bit better. Some of the substitutions, of course, I think he does need to do a little bit earlier and feel the game out. I think he always knows the solution, but his timing about when to make the changes. Got that. I agree. Lately, he's got that right. No, I think he was spot on against City, and I know oh. it's really low-level games, but I think he was spot on in the recent run of victories we had this year. Not to say that it's, it's much easier to take Saka off with 45 minutes to go when we're battering the team. I think you're I think you're bang on the money with the trust thing, and I was with, I was with you with that, and I wanted to see Kirill blooded earlier at the time. The only thing I would say for Arteta is, one, I'm not a fly on the wall at London Coley, and two, there must have been something not quite there with Kirill to for him to bet on or for him to bet on him. But then again, you spent 20 million on the man, and I guess hindsight's a wonderful thing. That sets me up perfectly for my last question for you, then, because you mentioned rotation. Obviously, it's Arsenal Luton. Mm -hmm. We've got Brighton on Saturday. We can't look towards that. Are you making mass rotation? Are you making rotating rotating options? Who are you putting in? What is your starting eleven? <laughs> like, talk to me about Luton Arsenal, man. It, it's difficult because, you know, I, I think I've got something that I would do, which would be a little bit more drastic than I think the Kelly. Yeah, no, man. That's... Football's a game of opinions, bro. We're not the manager. We're just having talks. Well, exactly. And so, look, I 100% would do more changes um, because I, I'm looking at a Luden team that have almost 13 players out, mate. Like, they're going to struggle to put out an 11. And there's going to be some players there that have less than 10 Premier League appearances. From there's going to be a lot of kids on the bench as well. There, there's going to be tons. And so we're already facing a rotated 11 let alone Luton's record away, let alone, respectfully, it being Luton. If you look at the next eight games, can we honestly sit there and say, which is the easiest game? It's Luton. Like, I mean, I, I don't know why we have to hide from that fact. So, I mean, this is the game to rotate. And so I want to see rotation. Um, I think the one, the one player that I'm looking at is Ben White, and I worry, where I think he's been in oh, yeah, incredible man, he's form. But he's playing a lot. I see the strapping, and I look... Let's say we lose Ben White. Is there a player in the squad that can replicate what he gives us? That's the one player I, I sit there. Probably, and go, probably not, but we're betting on Tommy Asu. And respectfully to Tommy, because I love him, the only thing I would say is you're a flight risk when it comes to play a, a, fix, a lot of fixtures and Benjamin White's quite durable. I wouldn't have faith in Tommy Asu being able to stay fit from now to the end of the season. I'd love to be wrong. I love the guy to bits, as I said, but... There's a lot of players that pick up injuries and very few, in my opinion, durable players in the core nucleus of our team, really. Yeah, and and then look, the big ones. I mean, Bakayo Saka and Gabriel ben. Martinelli, like, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, depending on how fit they are. Look, if Martinelli's fit, I have no problem with him staying, or playing, rather. But uh, I think those two, if we're going to do anything this season, those two have to be fit and firing. Have and to. They, they, must, they must be okay. So I look at those three as my priorities. Then the list goes down to your Declan Rice, your Saliba, your Gabrielle, the core. So I do the first three, and if the first three are okay, then you build down. To get off the fence, I think that um, I think Ben White should be okay. I'm not worried about uh, a red line. I would only listen to the physios. If the physios told me, then put Tommy in. But I would start with Ben White. I do Saliba, Gabrielle. I would include Zinchenko in this game. I don't think he's somebody that I look towards as being the main plan A, but I do look towards as probably needing him at some point in the run in. And I can't I can't have him cold. So I think this is a good game for him. Um I do think Thomas Partey needs a start now. I've seen several cameos, but if I'm gonna blood him for Bayern and I want him ready he needs for Bayern, at least an hour. He needs at least an hour. So I'm starting him. I'm having Declan Rice and I'm doing a shock. I think Martin Odegaard looked very tired, and I don't know if that's that's a position for me where we've got Vieira and Emil Smith Rowe that we need to start seeing them get minutes. Go and check so, in which one of those are, are in. Well, I mean, from from a perspective of it depends on who the right winger is because I'm also thinking is Saka 
going to be for somebody. me, Saka's the one. For me, you got to be on the bench, Saka, man. I don't feel right saying that, but if we can't rest you and, like you said, get over Luton, there's some serious problems. And that's why I actually would play both of them, but I play Vieira right wing and have Emil in, in the right central midfielder so we can get a little bit of an overlap happening. And I think in this way, you get both of those players' minutes, like meaningful minutes, and you don't sacrifice some of your dynamics as much. I would keep Kai Havertz and I'd keep Martinelli. So the team isn't drastically changed. I think that there's two, there's four changes there. Personally, I don't think Mikel does that as drastic, if I'm really being honest. I think he plays Martin Odegaard. I just think that he needs rest, you know? And I think he, he, for me, he does a lot of work out of possession too. Like that's another player that just runs for the team. And there's eight games in a month. <laughs> like he can't do that. And so with Vieira right wing, you need an overlap. You can't have him being touchline. He's not like Saka in that sense. He's not got the physical capacity to take people He's a wide on. Wide playmaker, him. really. Well, exactly. And so, and that's why I like the dynamic of an Emil Smith Rowe, who does have that overlapping ability to push you inside a little bit more. Plus, you've got Ben White as that option. So, I think that's a good way to hide and, ironically, give two players that, for me, if we do well this season, those are two players that can help us that can help get goals i think emil is somebody that has bubbled in cameos and not been given the opportunity and for good reason like there's people ahead of him but if we're going to be successful we need these bench players we need a squad of, yeah yeah Impact we need them to get out there referred to them as really for sure we're... like i'm looking at the midfield mate like for me i hate to be cliche the midfield is the engine room of a team it really is and if there's any people we'll die by that yeah you do and 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 i think I love our our starting 11, but if anybody is not fit or not injured, that's where we lose this title race for me. It's going to be in the engine room. So make sure that we make all the players that we know are fit up to speed, give them minutes. And I think in this way, you've got Zinni, you've got Neil, you've got Vieira, and you've got Partey, who I, I don't think is a bench player, but you've got major players that are getting minutes now. Um, and then look, towards the second half, I would probably put on your Trossard and try to give Martinelli some rest if he needs it you know but uh, again th those are probably those are probably my main what about you what do you, what do you make of the uh, this is the this movie? is where i'm conflicted george man because on one hand i agree and that is my thought you know what respectfully to loot in town you know i'm not trying to dish you lot but it's just it's loot in town they're, they're injured they're depleted they're gonna have a bunch of inexperienced squad players and if you haven't been able to play for looting in the premier league then i'm sorry i just don't really rate you like that and mm. we should be able to get it done regardless of who's out there that being said though i have to remind myself this is not a low level league cup match this is essentially a cup fight every premier league cup game final. is a cup final yeah and we as much as i like the performance against city and what we did and obviously we left with a point we're chasing points and it's not in our hands it's not like we've got a four point lead at the top of the table we need to maximize things if that game goes left if we make all these changes and it goes left then I'm going to have question marks at the, at, at the expense of sounding like a hypocrite. So I'm a bit conflicted because I want to make changes, but I don't. I don't want, really want mass changes because I think that is going to kill our balance and our rhythm and things like that. But that being said, regardless, once again, whoever goes out there should be beating them and quite frankly, moving to Luton. I'm a bit conflicted. I mean, run love to Ramsdale, but Raya remains in goal for me. Saliba and Gabriel play for me. I hear the Zinchenko shout and it is an opportunity. It could be Tommy and Zinchenko, to be fair, because even Kirill's had a lot of minutes both for Arsenal and his country. I would persist with Benjamin White. Benjamin White, give me 45 or an hour, then you can mm -hmm. come off. I'm going to start Tommy Yasu. I don't, I, I'm not saying to drop Kirill, but we've gone into Brighton. I need some more minutes in the legs for Tommy. I think him and Partey had great cameos. Now let me get an hour and then we can build up your fitness. So I'm going, what's it? Raya, Gabriel, Saliba, Benjamin White, Tommy Yasu. In the engine room, Partey, another one, kind of with Tommy Asu. Declan Rice is definitely playing. I'm going to be like Arteta. I'm going to play Odegaard. Then I feel bad for Smith Rowe. I feel for bad for Fabio Vieira. But I'm going to go with Odegaard. I just don't, I just love our engine room. I don't want it to change. But again, mm -hmm. you can come off. The wings is where I get a bit complacent or conflicted. You know, Havertz starts up front for me. I, Saka, you're on the bench. I, I think you made a great point about Fabio Vieira, which kind of complicates things for me. Do you know what? Gabriel Jesus on the left, Trossard on the right. I know people aren't happy with Trossard on the right-hand side, but I'd probably go with that. You know, Jesus and Trossard have just a bit more legs in them than Smith Rowe mm -hmm. and Fabio Vieira, which, as you said, it's catch-22 because I'm I'm saying you're not fit, but you're not getting an opportunity to show your fitness. I do think for what it's worth, Fabio Vieira will start. 
I mean, if there was ever a game to start Smith right, it should be now, but I'm pessimistic on that. So mm. that would probably be my lineup, bro. What score line are you going with? I think it's going to be 2 1, man. I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park. I think Luton are going to do their best to just, you know, have put some respect in their performance. I I think that the one time we might disagree, I think it'll be a big, bigger score line. I think it'll I be a 3 0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I this that. is not. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I think we're looking at a 3-0. And you know what? I'll, the reason I'll say it is not because I think Luton are poor or anything like that. They've got more injuries than we've got <laughs> rotation. It's crazy, you know? isn't it? So it's, uh, we're looking at almost 13 players, right? So, I mean, I think that's difficult. And, and let alone them setting up in a low block. Like, I think that's a given, right? But uh, I think without oh, yeah. your defenders, there's, they've got no defenders fit. Uh, you know what? 4-0. Four, four I'm changing mine. <laughs> 4-0, 4-0, 4-0. I don't know why I thought they would score. 4-0, 4-0. You've converted me. You made me just deep it. I'm doing the calculations. Especially what you just said about defensive structure. Yeah, 4-0 Arsenal, man. Smith Rowe's yeah. finally going to get a goal, man. It's been like two, there three years. <laughs> oh, I'll celebrate oh, that man. so much. I love that point. You know, I think that's the one That's the one player I've got a soft spot for in the squad that I just feel Same. like, for some reason, I, I love that profile, mate. I love what he could be. And I'm just like... Oh, I really hope you get an opportunity because I think you'll take it. But it looks it looks quite bleak for Smith Rowe. And I'm the president of the ML Smith Rowe fan club. And I want to be wrong, but two years left on your deal, barely starting. The summer, if it's true, and there really is 45 million pound offers. I mean, that is, it's, it makes sense. The irony is Ethan's going to ask questions of both Emil, Vieira. And you can't have all three of those. This is it. Minutes. Some's going to get offloaded, man. So there's going to, the best will survive. And I, you know what? I will say this as somebody that loves the boy, that's the best for Arsenal. I will hold the hand. Like, I think no person, no matter how much you love a particular player, as long as Arsenal are benefiting here, no one's going to say anything. And, you know, I, I was somebody that really liked Aaron Ramsdale, for example. And I think the last point I wanted to end, you know, on was, no matter how much you like players, at the end of the day, as long as you see an improvement, I think fans you kind just of... have to shut up. Yeah, and that yeah. tells your vision, the love for it. And I almost like the fact that Mikel is cerebral in that because to kind of echo your point, mm -hmm. every now and again, it feels not that there's light at the end of the tunnel, but it feels like we've found a new beginning. Arteta is yes. like, oh, like I know it's a bit different, but it looked like Jack would be here for a longer time than he would. Arteta had different ideas, or Jack had different ideas. It looked like May Ainsley Maitland Niles was going to stay. Something happened there. You know, we've seen it with a bad man. We've seen it with Tini, who he described as being a captain one day. We've seen it with Pepe. And that's what I like. Mikel Arteta, at the end of the day, he's being cold and cerebral and doing the calculations to get us to the next level. And I think what a lot of people fail to understand is, as much as this is a family environment and stuff, at the end of the day, this is high-level performance. Arteta has to do what he needs to do to get Arsenal to the next level because he's the first person people are pointing questions at. You saw it when it wasn't like this and we weren't the envy of the world. People didn't give a flying monkeys about your inverted fullbacks and all of that. So I get it. But as you said there, as long as it works, which Art I keep saying Arteta will make mistakes because he will. And I'm sure mm -hmm. he would say that. That's the only way to learn. So... Let's just keep it going. I, I echo you with the Ramsdale point as well, but that's what Arteta is paid to do. Find solutions where it doesn't appear that there's any. So, yeah, man, George, this has been fantastic. Let people know they yeah. can find you, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. You can find me at the Canon Podcast um, Come on. or at George V underscore AFC on X. And thank you, man. I, I love the convo and I loved uh, coming on here. It was brilliant. No, nah, man, I have to appreciate you, man, because I always listen to you lots content. You're obviously a great footballing man. I think we flowed together with this and I've got to get you back on, man. Like, hopefully the next time we do it, we're still smiling and whatnot. But uh, you never know in football, man. That's the beautiful thing about it. <laughs> and you know what? The beautiful thing is we can all see the same thing and see and say something completely different. And that's what it like, is. That's, that's football. <laughs> and that is football. It's subjective. But yeah, people, I'm sure you lot agree and disagree with a lot we've discussed over this hour. George has just told you where to follow him at. All his links will be in the description. So, yeah, shout out to you, George, because you lot won't see it, but it's been a quick turnaround getting this done. So I've got a big respect for you, man. Hopefully we do it again. Doors always open. So, yeah, people, on that note, we'll see you for Arsenal versus Luton. Peace. Peace. <laughs> Easy, 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 easy.